And as we mentioned, this is a talk about using types in Gleam. But also, these ideas translate to most other statically typed languages, and hopefully also this gradual type experiment that's happening in Elixir. So before I get into it, maybe a little bit about me and why I'm slightly qualified to talk about this. Um, I'm a front-end developer at a consultancy called data to impact I do sort of Elm and TypeScript and React there. I've been doing Elm, which is a statically typed functional programming language for building web apps for about six years now. I also do developer relations-y kind of things at an open source company called XYFlow. There we're doing React again and Svelte. And I'm also doing way too many things to do with Gleam these days. Um, Louis insists that I'm a member of the core team, despite having never contributed anything to the compiler. Um, I also maintain this front-end framework called Luster and an ecosystem of packages around that. And spending all of my time in the Gleam Discord is another full-time job. The title of this talk is Phantom Types and the Builder Pattern. So I suppose that begs the question, what are phantom types? And to explain that, we need to do a little detour on generics and what they look like in Gleam. As a kind of dummy example, we have a list. This is a type. This is how you de define custom types in Gleam. So we have a list type and two variants. One is a head, which contains an integer value and the rest of the list. And then there is a tail, which is the end of the list or an empty list. But right now, this type only contains ints. What if we want a list of strings or a list of structs or anything? To do that, we need generics or type parameters. And so that's what that looks like in Gleam. So we say list A. We have a type parameter called A. And that head has a value that could be any of these A's. And then the rest is another list of A's. So. What the heck does this actually have to do with phantom types? Well, if we just take a moment to look at this type again, I want to home in on two specific bits. Um, well, OK, three apparently, because I've left that black, but we'll ignore that. Um, the list A type de definition and this tail constructor. Um, so we're saying this list is generic over A, but our tail constructor has no data attached to it. So phantom types don't exist at runtime. We don't have any data that associates with this type. And to exemplify that, here is a tiny trivial example. We're defining these two variables, x and y, and we're telling Gleam, treat x as a list of ints and treat y as a list of strings. But they're both this tail, right? And so maybe intuitively, we should expect to be able to test equality on this and get back true. But actually, actually, if we do this in Gleam, we get a type error. This is a compile error that tells us Gleam was expecting y to be a list of ints, but it got a list of strings. That example was maybe not compelling. And probably your gut reaction was, well, that's kind of rubbish, because I knew that those two things were the same. So what are they actually good for? The first example is IDs, or really anything where we have a shared runtime representation, but we want to be able to distinguish between things at the type level. So this is kind of a common way to do IDs in Gleam. We have what's called an opaque type, which means that the module that this type is defined in can construct IDs, but outside modules can't see into the type. And so we expose this from ID function that just takes an integer and wraps it up. And then we might do something like this, right? Like we have a post ID and a user ID, and we have some sort of database call or maybe, a, maybe an API call or something to upvote a post. But there's actually a bug in this code. Can anyone spot it? This is the definition of our imaginary upvote function. And the first parameter is actually a post ID. 
and we've got the we've got the order the wrong way round because we're just using this ID type for both arguments. And so, like as a user, we've made an error here that our program will never catch. You know, we might be a month into production before we realize that user two has updated has upvoted a whole bunch of posts by accident. And so, there's a few different ways we can solve this, but one is with phantom types. So we have this kind type parameter now on our ID. We're not using it. That's what makes it phantom. And we keep the from int constructor the same. And then we let callers essentially refine what an ID type means. So we have, say, a user and a post type somewhere in our code base. And now we can make our upvote function type safe in the sense that although these two things have the same representation, we've told the type system that the first argument has to be a post ID. And so if we take that example again, now post ID is again an ID for posts, and user ID is an ID for users. We've got the arguments the wrong way around this time still, but now we get a compile error, right? And we actually get quite a helpful error as well. I was expecting an, a post ID, but we got a user ID. But also, we can take advantage of the fact that the representation of this type is the same no matter what kind. And so we can still write functions like, say, a debugging one that stringifies any ID. It's uh, generic over this kind. We don't care about that. We just want to pull out the value and turn it into a string. The, uh, the next example is validation. I'm going to show you some like password validation, which is like super don't do this actually in real life, but it's like good enough for a demonstration. Um, this is maybe the naive way that we would handle password validation. Maybe we want to create a user in our database or something. And so we have this password type alias for a string. And we would define, say, a function is valid that will check if a given password is valid according to some rules. Maybe it's long enough, whatever, has all the funky characters. And then we have a create user function that would take a username and a password and then return a result, right? And so if the password is valid, we get back an OK user. And if the password is you know, like too short or doesn't have a capital letter or whatever, we get back an error. And this is like fine, but I can already start spotting some problems with code like this. So for one, we have a similar problem from that previous example where there's nothing that actually distinguishes a password from a username. So password is a type alias here. It's just another name for a string type. And so we could accidentally swap the arguments around in our code and get a problem there. And also this create user function, this is probably going to be used in our business logic, somewhere like kind of deep in our code. And now we're having to deal with errors and a way to surf this, surface those errors to our users. So here's a perhaps different way to formulate this with phantom types. So again, we have this type parameter now on our password type, this validation type parameter. And then we define these two sort of dummy types. They have no runtime representation, so there's no shape to them. We have one for invalid, and we have one for valid. And we have a from string function that takes you know, whatever password someone's typed in, and it gives us back an invalid password. And with that, we can start refining our API. So we can write a validate function that takes only invalid passwords, because we don't need to check once we have a valid one. And it returns a result like before. You know, Is the password OK? If it is, then we get back a valid password. If it's incorrect, we get back a reason, you know, an error. Or we could write this kind of function to suggest a new password to a user if they provided an invalid one. Again. It's probably a logic bug in our program if we ever started suggesting passwords to our users if they were already good enough. And finally, we can rewrite that create user function to do away with the result handling now. We say this only takes in valid passwords, and so we only ever need to get back a user that we've created. At this point in our code, we've already asserted that the password is valid. We don't have to check again. We don't have to handle this in our business logic. We can handle the results much, much closer to the boundary of our program. 
And so the takeaway there is that phantom types restrict our APIs so that we can focus just on the happy path. So the talk is about phantom types and the builder pattern. So I guess now is a good time to touch on what the builder pattern is. Um, often, I mean, I'm a front-end developer, so like if I'm configuring a button or something, often there's a lot of optional properties. So we have this button config here. The label is required, but then we have all these kind of options to change how it looks and works. So we can maybe have an icon on the button. We can change the button's color, maybe some of its styles. And so the builder pattern really lets us define this config, and then we define, say, a constructor that handles all of the required stuff, in, in this case, just the label, and then we kind of none out all the optional things. And then we provide individual functions that take that config and sort of add one bit of the config to it over time. So we have this with color builder, which takes a config and then adds a color to it. We have one for an icon and so on. And then you end up with an API that's a bit like this. So we create a new button with the label Wibble, and we add a sparkles icon to it, or another formulation. We have a wobble button that is an error, but it's also disabled. And this stuff then sort of scales. You, you, know, you can configure this sort of infinitely over time. But again, there's actually a bug in this code. Can anyone spot it? We've defined what the icon on the button is twice. Um, and this is almost definitely a logic bug in our code, right? Like we said that we wanted a confetti, but confetti icon. And then later on down the line, we replaced it with sparkles. And so it turns out the, uh, the phantom types can help us here too. So I add a phantom type parameter to our config. This has icon parameter. And again, this is the same pattern, right? We have these two dummy types. They don't have any runtime representation, one for having no icon in our config and one for having an icon. And then we change our constructor function slightly. So now our button config that we get back when we create a new button has specifically no icon. And then we update our with icon builder to take only configs for buttons that don't have an icon and return a button config that asserts that there is an icon present. And so if we look at that code example again, now, like before, we get a type error. We get a type error on the sort of last step in the pipe that says, hey, this button config, I expected to have no icon, but you must have given me one in the past. Um, and so this is not just maybe an academic exercise, but this is also useful in the real world. I was going to show some code examples, and then I realized it's pretty much exactly what everybody showed, so I'm not going to do that, but I will just explain. Um, I use the phantom types and the builder pattern for some code that I do in Luster. Luster is this front-end framework that I write for Gleam, which has components that can run both in the server or in the browser. Your code stays the same, but the type of messages that the runtime can receive are slightly different there. Um, and to avoid basically duplicating, say, 90% of the code base, I have a phantom type on the, type, on the message that the runtime receives. And I can say, hey, server components only receive this sort of subset of messages. Browser components only receive, say, these one or two types. And that's really, really useful. And I also use these in a static site generator that I maintain for Luster. And there, we're using this builder pattern. So you build up your roots of your static type. Um, and the config there has fields for like, does this config have at least one static root? You know, so like if I run build, am I going to get a site out? Um, and I use the, the phantom builder type pattern there to make sure that the user, when they construct their static site, they have at least one static root. And so to recap, the takeaway here is that phantom types don't exist at runtime, but we can use them to restrict APIs that we write so that we spend more time focused on the happy path rather than, say, error handling or duplicating our code for very, very similar scenarios. <laughs>
thank you for listening. Uh, I think we've got a bit of time for questions now. We have some time for some questions. If anyone has some? Any questions? Yeah, go for it. Uh, is it possible to scale this phantom types to like multiple uh, properties? Because in your, the phantom yeah. example, we only showed that the, the, uh, it's has icon. So mm -hmm. would, would it be possible to extend it to has label and so on? Yeah. So the question is, um, can you extend this pattern for, say, like multiple facts or witnesses, right? Can you have multiple phantom type parameters? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. And that's exactly what I do in this statics type builder. Um, in Gleam, those would, those would have to be individual type parameters for each sort of extra thing that you want to track. But if you are using a language like TypeScript, or probably when Elixir gets their gradual type system, there you can use, say, a record. And you can use fields. Like you can, you can grow the number of things that you're tracking just on the fields of the record. So you have like one phantom type that is a record. And all of the things that you care about would be labels of that record. Does that make sense? Any other questions? OK. Cool. Then thank you again. Thank you very much.